astrophysicist who is currently at the ICRU professor at Institute of Photonic Science in Barcelona. He leads the quantum optics theory group there. And he has really a wide variety of research interests, which includes from ranging from quantum optics, quantum physics, quantum information science, many body theory, atosecond physics, statistical physics, and so on. And that has been reflected in the very wide variety of publications that he has on the subjects. And uh, he has also been awarded in 2013, the Gutenberg Prize from the University of Mainz, and more recently the uh, prize uh, from Johannes Hens Foundation of uh, Hamburg University, as well as the EPS Prize for the Quantum Optics and Electronic Science Division. And today I welcome him to this electronic or to this online talk and to illuminate uh, to educate us all about what he's doing. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm only sorry that I cannot be in India at this time. I would very much prefer to be there. Um, mm, the, um, the title of my talk is um, NISC Devices at Dick for Quantum Optics Theory Group, and I will give you some review of our activities in this area. Uh, I always start my talks with the logos of uh, agencies that um, finance our research at ICFA. Uh, there are many agencies, so the group is huge. It's about 30 people nowadays, uh, 17 PhD students and uh, 11 postdocs. And there are many actually Indian uh, members of the group, uh, Mohit, uh, uh, Sugak, which is not listed, Utsa, of course, and Sugak, which is not even listed here. Uh, and we collaborate with many friends all over the world, including the people in India, quite a lot. Okay, so the outline for the talk is I will start with uh, talking a little about the hype of quantum computing, then about uh, quantum computing with QDITs, which is more directed toward quantum simulations, actually. Uh, then uh, I will talk a little about improving quantum computing for D-wave like machines, some papers of my ex um, um, senior postdoc Tobias uh, Grass. Uh, I will mention some works about validation verification of quantumness, and that's it because there will be no time. So the hype of quantum computing, everybody knows what is the problem. The problem is that uh, it is with the, if you want to have a universal quantum computer that works without errors, we need a fault or error, error correction. And to have one, essentially, the estimates say that if you want to have one logical qubit which works without errors or at the low level of sufficiently low level of errors, then you need an overhead of roughly speaking 10,000 uh, qubits. So if you want to have a computer with 100 qubits, you need indeed. One, uh, one million qubits in order to realize it with photo uh, and error correction. And also error scaling should be independent of the size of the system. This is not the case in the present machines. And therefore it's a very big scientific and technological challenge. This is why John Preskill some time ago proposed, why don't we focus not on, on this um, noisy intermediate scale and quantum devices, uh, which probably will uh, maybe could have some quantum advantage. And the first paper on the so-called uh, quantum supremacy in experiment was a famous paper by Google and John Martinis, led by John Martinis, uh, who claimed that uh, what they did is that they uh, actually built a system of superconducting qubits and applied essentially a random circuit of gates to it uh, which have relatively good fidelity, um, uh, single qubit and two qubit gates, and then they sample from this random circuit at the output and the states of the output um, qubits. This uh, kind of random uh, sampling from the random circuit is has been proven by Aronson and others to be an NP-hard problem for classical computers, so the Google team and claimed that their uh, experiment was 10 years faster than all the other classical computers. 
Uh, a day later or two days later, IBM said that if they put all their computers on this problem, it will be only two and a half days uh, longer. But the, the the most important thing maybe with which this uh, experiment stimulated was the progress in classical simulation codes, in particular tensor network codes. And uh, in, in August last year, these guys uh, from China have, uh, so, to, so to say, simply beaten the Sycamore quantum circuit of, of Google by doing classical simulations. Uh, now Google has presented the uh, new experiment, I think with 73 qubits, uh, but still uh, uh, you may say that tensor network approach is not scalable, but either is the, um, um, either are the experiments, it's very difficult to scale them to much bigger numbers. So there is a certain competition here between classical simulation, novel classical simulations and, and experiments. Uh, and this, uh, another experiment there where quantum advantage has been um, claimed is the Chinese experiment by Jai Wei Pan on so-called boson sampling. So this is really photons which are going through the random circuit of uh, beam splitters. And uh, after passing this splitter again, we sample or we calculate how many photons are in each corresponding mode. Uh, and this sampling problem is all, has also been proven to be NP-hard. Uh, however, as, as I say, in the recent year, there has been also a lot of progress in classical uh, simulations of um, boson sampling problem. In particular, this PRL is very promising and um, maybe pretty soon the classical simulations will be as fast as uh, quantum um, computers. Uh, the problem with this uh, existing noisy intermediate scale devices is that in anything in which they were supposed to be applied, and everybody was very enthusiastic about it, say, three years ago, nowadays there is much more critical um, opinions about it. For instance, here, limitations of algorithm optimization algorithms of, on NISC devices. Uh, the bounds we obtain indicate that substantial quantum advantages are unlikely for classical optimization unless noise rates are decreased by orders of magnitude or the topology of the prob problem matches that of the device. The, uh, the same thing is with quantum advantage in the quantum machine learning. Maria Schuld, one of the leaders of machine learning community, asked in this PRX quantum in the last year, is quantum advantage a right goal for quantum machine learning? Uh, you probably remember that in the last year, one of the scientists from, uh, computer scientists from University of Oxford published the article about the quantum computing bubble, which was reprinted in Financial Times. Um, the name of the guy was Nikita Goriano. Uh, so, to summarize my first moral is that quantum advantage of NISC devices is, first of all, in useless problems so far, but also they are beaten by the tensor net, some of them at least are beaten by tensor network more, uh, methods, and there are things that NIS cannot do at this stage. And that is why I, and this is also, so to say, supported by very recent article uh, by um, Thorsten Höfler, uh, Thomas Hehner, and Matthias Troyer, that was published in the beginning of this month, uh, uh, where they talk about realistic adiatic quantum ad advantages. So they put uh, emphasis on the disentangling hype from practicality. So they say, let's do the things which have some practical advantage, not necessarily rigorously proven, like in the case of sampling problems, but something that really can work. And uh, in the key insights of this article, so the article is that most of today's quantum algorithms may not achieve practical speed ups. This is in particular uh, in the case of uh, algorithms that are being used in quantum chemistry and material science. They are simply not optimal and one has to work on them in order to make them really useful. Due to limitations of input and output bandwidth, quantum computers will be practical only for small data, not big data problems. So applications in quantum machine learning are questionable. And also quadratic speed ups delivered by algorithms such as Groover search are insufficient for practical quantum advantage. So 
the moral is that we should do things which can be practically useful. And of course, my answer to that is quantum simulators. So the ideology of quantum simulators is very simple. You, there are many quantum phenomena which are difficult to describe, like uh, which are interesting, like superconductivity or just quantum dynamics of uh, strongly correlated uh, quantum many body systems. These phenomena may have important applications and they are often difficult to be described with the standard uh, computers. And therefore, why not use a sim another simpler and better controllable quantum system to simulate, understand, and control this phenomenon? This goes back to Feynman. In one of his last papers, he has termed this kind of device quantum simulator. It's really a quantum computing device of special purpose. And here, uh, these devices can be analog or digital. And, uh, and uh, also they can make, uh, this can be a great use of NISC devices because here we don't really care about error, um, fault tolerant error correction. In fact, here the errors or the noise can even be a, a opportunity rather than a nuisance because it can mimic the disorder in the system which is very often present in condensed matter system or you can mimic noise in the system which is also very often present in in physical systems. So uh, let me start now the review of the things that we propose to do with QDITS, which is a kind of new um, direction. So uh, we try to formulate indeed uh, also universal quantum computation and possibility of quantum error corrections with, uh, with the uh, QDITS systems, but we do it in such a way that with really our future applications will, will be focused on on quantum simulation rather than uh, looking for um, for um, the vague uh, quantum supremacy in rigorously proven sampling problems. So the first paper maybe of this series is the paper led by Valentin Kasper, who is now in, uh, in the quantum technology industry. Several people are on this collaboration with Philip Kauter from Trento and also collaboration with Heidelberg people, Freddy and J.S. Gebert Hartiemann, a legend of the molecular anatomic physics. Uh, and what we propose here uh, is the um, system of, um, of um, atoms, uh, which, are, which are actually a mixture. We have, uh, uh, we have a fermionic, a small fermionic um, clouds of atoms. There's an error here in the caption. Uh, small uh, clouds of fermionic atoms that have spin, so they can serve as a big spin in a sense, or QDIT if you wish, and they are connected by this uh, long uh, elongated uh, Bose-Einstein condensates of bosons. And then what we do, the, the interactions between the fermions or between the spins of fermions are, are uh, carried over by uh, this um, through the Bose-Einstein condensate of bosons. Okay, and this is essentially the the thing you have phonon induced interactions because in the Bose Einstein condensate you have Bogolubov design phononic modes or sound modes, if you wish, and this will cause the interactions between the, between the big spins. And these spins uh, uh, and these interactions can be such that you can realize indeed uh, universal quantum computing, and indeed you can also realize quantum error uh, correction. And that was the first proposal that we knew. We also studied the similar system uh, in the context of possibility of quantum simulation of lattice gauge theories, which is um, a complicated um, problem, in particular non-abelian lattice uh, gauge theories. Uh, and for this particular uh, system, we have proposed a kind of novel method of uh, achieving non-abelian gauge invariance by the so-called dynamical decoupling. The idea is here very simple. You have this. Uh, in general, in lattice gauge theory, you have a system in which the matter lives on the sides of the lattice and the, uh, the gauge fields live on the links. Uh, so here, the idea is that we applied the um, applied the random unitaries to this link, and in this way, we assure the uh, local gauge uh, invariance of of the theory. So the then intuitively you can think about it. If you have a if you have a figure like this, and this figure is uh, absolutely doesn't have rotational symmetry, 
if you start to rotating it rapidly, then of course, at the, in effect, what you see is a, is a sphere which has a rotational symmetry. So similar idea is applied in this paper for the non-abelian gauge rings. Uh, we have also developed uh, the method of looking at the and the skewed it systems uh, from a point of view of quantum approximation, approximate optimization algorithms that has been proposed for NISC machines. But here, the difference is that he, we have here a long range interactions because these interactions that are mediated in our system via Bose-Einstein condensate by or are long range. And therefore, um, the, um, the, and this leads to certain differences in in the system, but this uh, QAO A can be applied quite nicely and work uh, quite well. You know how it works. It works in such a way that you have uh, unitaries which have some uh, which have some parameters. You um, you apply them with the gate operation. You create a state. Then you optimize the state in the classical computer, etc. It's a hybrid program which works quite well for, we have applied it here for uh, some physical problem of lattice gauge theory, but also for some of the simple optimization problem. Of course, all this uh, optimization application for optimization, as I'm saying, are very, very, very primitive and they are very far from what really good supercomputers can do. But anyway, one has to start thinking about it. Another uh, inspiration for us comes of of course, also from another type of experiments, not only on atom uh, atomic mixtures of so fermion bosons, like I was saying at the beginning, but also from uh, trapped ions. Very recently, Martin Ringbauer uh, from the, uh, in Innsbruck, from the group of Reiner Blatt, has been able to realize qua universal qua QDIT quantum professor with, uh, processor with ions, with trapped ions, and in his case, he can uh, he has ions which have six internal uh, states and therefore he can uh, realize the QDIT with uh, D equal uh, six. And this is a very beautiful experiment. There is a lot of control here and it's really uh, open uh, the way to nice application in particular for applications in quantum simulations as I, as I stress. Uh, in fact, we, have, we are now calculating uh, and the and application of this variational quantum uh, approximate optimization algorithm to uh, realize the simulator of um, lattice gauge theory in in this uh, in the system of trapped uh, uh, ions. In this case, this is uh, proposed here for the uh, two uh, for the. Um, dimensional system but you can do it also with one dimensional system and the point is in this case is that uh, we uh, what we do here is that we somehow uh, get rid of the fermionic degrees of freedom from the problem uh, by some tricks that have been developed by Erez Zohar mostly and earlier Ignacio Tirak Sirak, and we end up then with the with the um, simpler Hamiltonian that can be indeed um, simulated by um, by the uh, by the um, quantum by the quantum simulators with ions, and this is done by uh, mapping it on on a on a um, spin system, and the spin uh, system has a relatively well, it's not simple, but it has a relatively doable uh, form, which can be then um, realized within a qubit, uh, qubit model. And as I say, it goes back to the papers by Zohar and Sirak many several years ago. And this, uh, in this model, so far we have been uh, tr trying to see how the uh, lattice gauge theory can be simulated, in particular how the dynamics of lattice gauge theory can be simulated. For, uh, at the beginning, we started with the abelian lattice gauge theory, so this is, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, we apply the random unitaries which depend on certain angles theta, and then we 
we uh, we apply the circuit variation of circuit then we optimize the state with respect to the parameters and it turns out that we reproduce the evolution of the system with this variation of uh, time evolution quite quite uh, quite well the comparison is here with exact diagonalization solution of the problem for of course for not too big system but it works for not too big so we hope that variation will also be work for the bigger ones okay um let me change the gears and say something about the works that tobias grass has done for uh, adiabatic computing which is a different story so uh, in a quantum annealing problem as you know what you have is a hamiltonian which is time dependent you want to find the ground state of the hamiltonian of the problem uh, but uh, you start with the Hamiltonian of the driver, which is simple for which you can find the uh, ground state very easily. So typically the Hamiltonian of the problem in D-wave machine would be uh, easing spin glass, so randomly coupled classical easing spins, but the driver will be a strong, uh, will be a um, transverse field Hamiltonian in which you, uh, which is proportional to sigma X matrices. So this is what makes the problem uh, um, uh, quantum, but you also can use as a driver uh, a Hamiltonian, which is again a sum of the local Hamiltonian. So it's easy to uh, diagonalize and to find the ground state of this um, beast. Uh, but you can add here some uh, magnetic field and sigma z. Guys. If this uh, hi actually happen to uh, uh, to push your Using spins to look into the direction that they should look in the ground state, then it turns out that this bias fields obtained from the partial knowledge even of the ground state can be very useful and they speed up the uh, the adiabatic process very much. So this is a um, calculation that has been done by in two papers by Tobias uh, Tobias Brass. By so if you know, for instance, uh, some at least. Uh, spins in the ground state configuration. If you some have some prediction about them because of you, you can guess them from the uh, stronger parts of the disorder and things like that. If you stack this thing into the into the bias fields here in this driver Hamiltonian, then your adiabatic uh, uh, or quantum annealing problem is solved much much in a much much uh, faster uh, way. Uh, and uh, mm, so this is what what can be learned for d-wave like machines the, and finally i want to go to verification validation and certification of quantumness this is another uh, set of papers that we are working on here Dick, for uh, mm, this is one example of this papers by guillaume muller regard uh, the paper led by rene frero as a systematic inference of Bell inequalities from average two body co correlations. So, what we do is uh, suppose we have many body systems in which we know the first moment of some um, observ local observables and also second moments of local observables. Okay, so this M's and uh, M's. And then what we do, we just take an uh, uh, average. So translationally invariant or even um, permutationally invariant quantities, which is the sum of this first uh, order correlation or sum of local second order correlation or sum or, of or um, two point correlations. And then from this, you can impose a theorem that uh, if you take a um, arbitrary semi um, positively semi-definite matrix A, and uh, you take the matrix of cumulants, which is the C tilde, uh, and you take uh, arbitrary vector H and then the vector formed by this M's and M1s and M2s. And then there is a certain classical uh, limit for that, and then you can form a Bell inequality, which has this general form. Okay. And then you can, uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, of course, Look at the, this as a kind of energy, which is uh, smaller than certain maximal value, which is um, smaller than the classical bound. If you violate this thing, you violate the Bell inequalities. And we have um, uh, constructed this kind of uh, inequalities for uh, different 
local observables so for atoms that have spin one half, spin one, spin three half, spin two. And we have found different uh, regions of violation which uh, be go beyond the, what was known before concerning spin squeezing inequalities and things like that. Because of course, these quantities which we are measuring here are essentially the global components of the spin and its fluctuation. Uh, we also can, uh, in the recent paper, in uh, which was actually published in Quantum, I guess, we have uh, generalized all this approach with this uh, matrices to uh, uh, to uh, um, situations in which the observables are uh, really the um, uh, are local, of course, but they are not on not the uh, arbitrary components of the spin, but we focus only on the populations, populations in arbitrary basis, but just populations. Um, and uh, and then again, we can uh, find out the system of uh, parameters where we beat, so to say, the known uh, spin squeezing inequalities and other inequalities. And we can, in, in this way, uh, probe quantum entanglement from this kind of uh, average quantities, but which involves only sublevel, magnetic sublevels populations, if you think about magnetic systems. And this, as I'm saying, this was published in last year in Quantum. Uh, you can also uh, think about uh, certifying the metrological usefulness of quantum statistics. And this is the last paper that I want to mention, a semi-definite programming approach. Again, a paper led by Guillaume Müller we got with Anubhav Kumar Srivastava, as you can imagine, from India, uh, and Irene Ferro again. So the idea is that think that the, what we what we have here is that we assume that we have partial tomographic data of some system with some uh, measure uh, with some elements of uh, measurement, uh, uh, with some results of some measurements, and then uh, we have we en we encode it with some. Para uh, uh, theta dependent um, uh, operation. And then we try to uh, find the, uh, the, um, the, the, the density matrix, which is uh, in, uh, which is um, in agreement with this partial tomographic data. And yet, which, uh, which uh, me, which is the best for the um, uh, meteorological application. So, uh, the, uh, in other words, we want to have a bounce on the quantum fissure information with respect to a given encoding and compatible with the inferred expectation value, which is the certificate. Okay. And with this suitable um, uh, data, we can compare our bounds with analytical lower bounds, which is obtained from squeezing as was discussed in the works by Geza Todd and uh, in this um, um, or review by uh, Luca Pezza and others. Uh, and so we apply in particular this uh, approach to the, um, the problem of one axis uh, twisting dynamics. So this is a, a, a dynamics in which the Hamiltonian essentially is J Z squared, and what it does, it uh, if you start with the coherent state, it it it, it twists it and makes it squeeze first, but then if you uh, wait uh, longer, it will be even creating some kind of Schrodinger cats and things like that. So we we do. Um, our method reveals higher med med metrological uh, bounds than spin squeezing for the same uh, second moments data. So in this sense, it is, um, uh, it is the difference is not very much, but anyway, it's, it's sufficient to, uh, to see, to see the squeezing, uh, uh, the squeezing bound on the uh, Fisher information, Fisher information is given by this quantity here. Uh, and also, uh, our method is useful, as I say, to detect meteorological usefulness for as long time in which the uh, state is no more just squeezed and Gaussian, but it's non-Gaussian and it's more complicated. It's actually kind of 
Schrodinger cat at some moments, etc. Uh, and this is uh, indeed uh, the, taking into account higher moments. We can uh, we can um, so if we take the data up to fourth moment, we can uh, say much more about the uh, bounds on the meteorological bounds on our on uh, as the state um, evolves in time and becomes highly non-Gaussian. So the conclusion and outlook for this is that this is a novel um, driven method in the form. It is actually done in the semi, uh, why is it semi definite uh, programming? Because uh, uh, I missed this one, because the, the Fisher information becomes a function of this, uh, of this theta angle. And essentially, what we have to do, we have to minimize uh, uh, this. Um, we have to maximize this uh, quantity, which is then given by the trace of uh, uh, row with uh, with uh, uh, with the. I mean, essentially, is we have to do maximize this quantity uh, such that the row minus and LL plus are semi-positively definite. So it's a typical problem for semi-definite uh, programming. And I think that um, it's improvement. Uh, we show some improvements of lower bound methods based on squeezing. We detect new state meteorologically useful with very few resources, dicky state, multi-headed cat states, and things like that. And we also use, uh, we uh, in the future, we want to look at the optimization over the generator uh, of the um, dynamics here and explore other and coding operation. And I think with this, uh, I um, I have also one paper here that is also related, but I think I skip it. It's about machine learning and also um, imposing the, uh, the information about the full density matrix and its properties from partial measurements. But I think I have no time for that. I would say that something about this uh, sufficient separability criteria in linear maps, because these are also criteria that are related to uh, detection of entanglement and validation of entanglement, et cetera, et cetera. So this is an old paper in which, roughly speaking, the idea is that if you have a family of map, which let's say have this kind of form, it's uh, trace of row times one plus alpha row plus uh, sigma rho, rho tilde, where rho tilde is the uh, partial um, transposition with respect to subsystem A. And if uh, if these parameters are such uh, that they fulfill certain inequalities, then uh, if rho is a proper density matrix, then and the map acting on this uh, rho will be a separable state. And then, of course, the, what you get from that is that you can get a sufficient separability criteria uh, because if you invert the, the map on sigma, which is uh, positively defined, then the result must be separable. So this uh, gives you a, a following criterion for uh, for sigma that uh, I mean you can just invert, you apply, and then sigma tilde again is a partial transposition with respect to Alice. Uh, and then if this inequality is fulfilled, then you know that sigma is separable. So it's a sufficient, it's a um, sufficient condition for separability. And uh, we have recently, uh, okay, you can, you can generalize it to kind of Breuer kind of maps. This is more complicated, but we have done it also in this original PRA paper, but recently on the, occasion of a special issue of open systems and information dynamics. Uh, we have also generalized this problem to many body systems. This paper is devoted to the memory of Andrzej Kosakowski, one of the world leaders of uh, linear maps and uh, master equations and um, uh, open system dynamics. And uh, so these are similar theorems as the previous one, but now they are applied to uh, they are applied to um, to these maps that uh, uh, act on many body systems. And that's it. Yes. I don't want to go to details because it's quite technical. The conclusions is that in geophysics and beyond, there are many subjects that you can do 
with uh, without looking for rigorous uh, quantum supremacy, but you rather look into uh, uh, concrete problems in which uh, quantum NISC devices can be useful and where you can validate them and validate entanglement and things like that. Uh, we uh, are enjoying physics also by combining all this business with music, actually. So I wanted to finish with the music. Uh, we try to sonify quantum physics. So try to take interesting quantum states or dynamics even and translate it into sounds. And this is done by the composer who is in my group since a couple of years, Reiko Yamada. And uh, this is, I, mean, I don't know, can you hear it? I don't know if the sound is. In... But anyway, the, uh, we have, uh, there is a even long play or a vinyl in internet if you are interested. The composition that is going now is uh, Andres Luis Richter and Vasco Tria. That was presented in the Sonar, uh, Sonar Festival, one of the most important festivals of electroacoustic music last year. And with this, I want to finish. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Levenstein, uh, for a very, very interesting talk and on a very diverse set of applications of your ideas. Uh, so now uh, I'll open this for questions. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, okay. So anybody, uh, especially the students, I just invite them to ask questions. Okay, can I ask some questions? Of course. Uh, okay, uh, see, in this, uh, in the work that you did on the um, quantum electrodynamics, the, the one you just showed, what exactly did you want to calculate this? I mean, there are um, several things that one should calculate, one would like to calculate, but uh, one of the things that is interesting is, is quantum dynamics of this model. So. Uh, not the stationary state, not the ground state, but rather you prepare some interesting excitation and you look how it evolves in time. So for instance, uh, you can uh, look at the instability of the vacuum state with respect to pair production. And this was the first experiments with ion traps actually by Reinhard Bratt and Peter Soller where they were looking into this. So with the quantum simulators simulating the, um, pair production from the, let's say, in unstable vacuum. In the papers that we have been uh, um, pushing forward with this uh, quantum electrodynamics, we usually look at the effects of um, uh, confinement. So we prepare an antiparticle-particle pair, or if you wish, electron-hole pair, uh, but, but in the in the more general language, particle antiparticle, and we let it evolve. Typically, what happens this and this is like a meson. This meson will typically want to spread and to thermalize, but when it spreads, it suddenly starts to feel the the confinement and therefore stops spreading and starts to oscillate in space and time. And this is like uh, this um, lack of thermalization that is related to um, confinement phenomena. So I think the dynamics is the most important uh, direction to look into in this complex systems because this is uh, in the big system, it's really very difficult to uh, simulate with classical computers. It's more 
systems, you can still do it, but uh, when you go to bigger, no. No, I, I mean, see, my, I, I mean, I don't know whether this is a relevant here, but I, I wanted to know how do you actually simulate a relativistic, I mean, proper Dirac electron on the lattice, on, on this kind of a lattice, the way you're talking about? Well, if you do, if you want to do the uh, simulations with the, uh, so, okay. Uh, as I told you, in the approach that we had, we usually um, eliminate part of degrees of freedom and end up with the spin model. And then the question, so I don't have really fermions, okay? But in the in the in many experiments, you do have um, fermionic at, for me, for instance, experiments with uh, atoms in ultra cold atoms in optical lattices. You have fermionic atoms which play a role of the of the matter. And on top of that, you can have on the links of the lattice, you can have some uh, spins which come from bosonic degrees of freedom or something like that. But this is more or less how, we, uh, how it is. And then, uh, I mean, what do you look at? I mean, you can look at many things, but as I'm saying again, one of the ways is to let the system evolve and look at the dynamics. And then how do you diagnose the system? Well, in the case of ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, you can make a photo in which with the resolution of single atom in the single side of the lattice, you can see whether something is there. And even you can do this photo with the spin resolution. So you can know whether there is an atom or it's spin up or spin down. I see, thank you. No, because see, the reason I'm asking you uh, this question is that usually you see when, when we talk about this point, I mean, we, you talked about this pair production and so on, right? Uh, so usually it's attributed to the existence of these particle hole pairs and so on. I mean, the electron. Uh, yeah. So uh, so how do, I mean, in, in this kind of setups, how do I actually see that? See, the, for example, questions like this Klein paradox and so on, which come up when we study this. The questions like what? Sorry, I didn't. Klein, uh... Klein paradox. Klein paradox. Oh, Klein, Klein paradox. Tunneling. Klein paradox and Klein tunneling. See, these come up in the context when I have potentials in quantum yes. electrodynamics in the I presence mean, of potentials. That is so it's true. Possible to study. Mm, that is true, but. Um, mm. I mean, there are some papers which I don't remember now in which they claim that they can simulate the Klein paradox in particular. Uh, the, uh, um, so roughly speaking, I mean, the, 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 um, the 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 things that you can do with this kind of system is okay. First of all, you can make your lattice in such a way that it uh, has for non-interacting particles, it has a, a dispersion relation which corresponds to Dirac equation. So it's a, like in graphene, but you can do it also artificially in other systems. So this is the first thing. So when you have Dirac equation, then you can play with the, with the mass in this Dirac mm -hmm. equation, which is a parameter, and with the potential in this Dirac equation, which is also a parameter. And both of these things can be controlled in case of ultra cold atoms in the lattices with lasers somehow. And then you can try to go to the regime where the Klein uh, paradox uh, appears. Okay, thank you. Thank I think that the, this is the only, I, as I say, I remember there are some papers that they claim that they can simulate it in, uh, in optical uh, lattices with ultra cold atoms, but I don't remember how to so. Thank you, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? All right, if there are uh, no other questions, I think then we can uh, thank uh, Professor Levenstein for a really, very interesting talk and where he has combined so many different ideas. So once again, I think we should thank him. So I'm clapping, I don't know if maybe people should unmute and clap. So thank you very much, Dr. Lance. Thank you.